Hey, great. Thanks. So good to be with you. Uh, my name's Josh Daniels, and I'm the local county clerk and county auditor in a place called Utah County, Utah. Um, Utah County is kind of a growing, increasingly urbanizing county about an hour south of Salt Lake City. Um, we've got hundreds of tech startups actually in our community. We've come to call ourselves Silicon Slopes. So you can uh, both work at your startup and go skiing. So, um, you know, take that Silicon Valley. Um, but we pride ourselves on being disruptors. Uh, it was over 40 years ago that Alan Ashton, a computer science professor at Brigham Young University, invented and founded WordPerfect in our community. That was the first company that really started modern word processing as we know it. And today, the, the tech revolution continues in our community. Um, I think it's a little ironic that I'm standing here today and that we're all sitting here talking about maybe our collective efforts to improve government, um, but we don't really care that much about government. We in this room actually, I think, care about improving life for people. And government happens to be a vehicle by which we can improve life for people, but it wasn't always that way. Um, government's only a vehicle for improving the lives of people if we actually have a government that is of, by, and for the people. And so the thing that makes that possible is democracy itself. The most important innovation in distributive technology was distributing power from the one to the many. And we sit here as beneficiaries of that revolution in distributing power. And so how ironic that we're now today talking about technology that actually delivers on that promise at the level of administering government services and, and, and different government operations. So democratic elections are literally the bedrock of distributive power. And by leveraging blockchain technology, we can envision a world in the not so distant future in which election administration itself is distributed. Can you, oh, I can advance the slides here. That's great. So really the future of elections are distributed democracy. And um, election integrity, as you know, today it dominates the airwaves. There is an increased level of scrutiny and concern about election administration, particularly in the wake of the last presidential election. And I think blockchain technology is the future uh, to your question that can help us resolve some of those concerns. Certainly it takes good implementation. It takes the buy-in of not just those who administer elections, but the people themselves. Um, the promise of voting in a blockchain environment is we can get to a point where there's little to no cost. Really the citizens essentially own the technology themselves. Um, it can be virtually impossible to corrupt. Uh, with the way dis um, distributive technology works and you have complete transparency, you have the ability for voter identity to be protected and voters could actually confirm that their vote was counted. Um, we've done some of this in our own county recently. Um, security is one of the biggest concerns in elections and as the last presentation pointed out, the eligibility to vote is a key element of that security. And uh, what we need to do is find ways to leverage blockchain technology to manage identity and ensure uh, voter identity and voter eligibility. Um, currently, we distribute ballots digitally using a platform. We used the votes platform in a couple of elections in Utah County. This is particularly helpful for those that are disabled that need to leverage the, the technology on their phone um, for handicap accessible voting. It's also really efficient for delivering ballots to overseas voters who don't want to rely on maybe a slow postal system to receive their ballot and return their ballot digitally to our office. Um, and so in that way, we can securely transmit ballots to voters and securely have ballots returned to us in ways that we weren't able to do previously. Um, and of course, post-election auditing and general transparency for the public is, is incredibly important. With our implementation and use case, we were able to uh, share with the public kind of in a public way 
images of paper ballots that were essentially printed but that were digitally marked by voters and compare that to the blockchain record and then compare that to the actual tabulation results from our, our, our equipment. So this is the platform that we used uh, in Utah County, Votes. Um, Votes is one of the first blockchain-based voting companies. Um, they essentially uh, facilitate the distribution of the ballots and then those ballots are returned. And then you know the information from that ballot is essentially parked on, on the ledger so that uh, it acts as a check. It's not necessarily a smart contract-based system, but it is leveraging uh, blockchain technology to be a repository of the vote information so that others could see what was transmitted uh, to the voter and back to the, the voting office. Um, if you were at the conference last year, you'll remember one of the awardees uh, was, was our county, but another awardee was also, um, was also uh, the winner of the Courage Award, and this is based on um, an election audit that took place in Guatemala. Um, this is probably, you know, one of the most important use cases for the blockchain technology is the ability to audit, the ability for there to be public transparency. Um, people want to know that their votes were received, that they were counted correctly, and there's no funny business happening. Um, so just given this general increased scrutiny on election management, the public trust of election administration is critical. It's critical to our democracy. And by distributing the administration of elections themselves using this technology, we can ensure the people that the promise of distributed power in our democratic system rem remains just as strong as it was when our ancestors signed that piece of paper that's in the vault about you know six blocks away. That's really the promise of blockchain technology in the election administration. And now I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Votes, V-O-A-T-Z. And in fact, Philip from their company was gonna be here, wasn't able to make it, so I'm, I'm here. I'm not sure exactly. Um, you know, the, the earlier question about implementation and adoption by, by government is a really important one because right now um, elections are operating in essentially a highly regulated environment where there's certain rules and protocols. The biggest one is what we call certification. Every election system in the country generally has to go through some kind of a certification process. Elections are not run at the federal level in America, they're run at the state by state level. And so each state has state laws that require that voting equipment and voting systems are certified. That certification process can take place at the state level. It can also be outsourced kind of to testing laboratories. There's something called a voting system test laboratory. There's also the Election Assistance Commission, which is a federal commission. Both of those offer essentially a certification and testing process for election equipment and election systems. Well, the problem is that this technology is so new that there are no standards promulgated under which this system could be tested and certified. And so we're kind of in a gray area just to use the technology um, simply because there are no certification standards to test the technology against to then give it the certification it needs so that it can be legally used in these various state jurisdictions. So which is why we're currently only using it in some exceptional cases like those for overseas ballots and those handicapped voters and things like that. So I think in time as we develop standards for these systems, they can then be certified against those standards and then you can see mass adoption of these systems throughout the country. Um, so currently, that's really the focus of the companies in this space. So whether they're looking at smart contracts, I'm sure they are. Are they there yet? It's kind of irrelevant because the first step is mass adoption, and, and the barrier to mass adoption is this certification process. All right, one more question from the crowd. Hello, my name is Austin. I work at IBM, but I will not claim to represent their views. So my question is, either your general opinion or your experience in Utah, how do you respond to uh, the, the question of like, how can we verify that the person casting this vote through the blockchain, which we recognize has all of these great benefit, like these benefits, how can we verify the person is who they say they are? 
either within Utah or at a mass scale. Right. I mean, that, that is the central concern largely of, of those who maybe are unfamiliar with the technology. Um, you know, the banking industry does this, right? Before the banking industry allows you access digitally to your account, it's going to verify your identity. You know, this is generally a class of technology called KYC, know your customer. In the case of what we do with votes, there's a KYC plugin that verifies people's identity through literally a selfie, video-based selfie of their face and then a photograph of their government ID. When those things are matched and verified, it's then matched against our records of eligible voters, which then triggers that that voter can then vote because um, they are an eligible voter in our jurisdiction and we have a certain voting precinct assigned for that voter. So that determines what kind of ballot they get, which candidates they're voting on. Um, so, you know, that's generally the way that it works. Uh, and so, but at the end of the day, identity management is key and identity verification is key. Right now, that's how we're doing it. And I think, um, you know, right now that's good enough for the financial sector. In fact, it's maybe a step beyond. Um, that's pretty robust KYC, the selfie and the government identity. Um, and I think some element of that is really how we, how we get there. Great, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up to the stage. Next up to the stage, we have Gerard Dache. Oh, hey, Amelia, Amelia. is gonna to speak tomorrow, but there's, a, there's something I wanna just share and talk about with, uh, with regard to voting. And she's totally, uh, she has no idea what I'm gonna do. This is true, I have no yeah. idea. And, and for, those of you, for those of you who know me, I throw people under the bus all the time. Um, so Amelia's a pioneer in, in this space, right? And um, uh, I was so uh, impressed with the first time I heard you speak and, uh, and to see everything that you've done. But one of the things that really was impressive to me was we, um, Amelia shared with me that there's a lot of fo folks very opposed to not only blockchain voting, but any kind of voting on, on the uh, electronic, connect to the internet, right? So Amelia said, Gerard, I have a great idea. Why don't we invite the folks that are diametrically opposed to this whole concept and have a discussion? So did we? We did. You want to tell, you want to tell them a little bit about, about what happened and what happened since? Yeah, sure. So Gerard set up a panel, and the panel consisted of people like myself that are pioneers in this space and advocates like Eugene. And then we had people on the other side of the aisle, folks from Verified Voting, and from the Open Source Institute who would like all voting globally to be done on paper at the polls on election day. Side note, it is a proven fact that former US President Lyndon B. Johnson cheated in his senatorial race in Texas on paper at the polls on election day. So don't, don't let anyone tell you that that can't be hacked. Historically, it has. Um, so we came together on a panel and uh, we had, we had each one of us gave our piece on, on elections, and towards the end, there was panel discussion back and forth, and a gentleman from one of the organizations that's opposed to electronic voting basically um, jumped in and attacked one of the vendors. Um, he attacked one of the, one of the vendors, uh, perpetrated a lie that's been spread about this vendor. Um, I have firsthand knowledge of that because I was a customer of the vendor and I talked to the Department of Homeland Security and the NSA and I knew that what this man was saying was a lie. Um, and attacked and said, you just can't do it. It can't be done. Electronic voting can't be done. To which I replied to him uh, several things. I said, number one, what you're saying is a lie and we have to be honest. If we're going to move forward as a society, we demand honest debate. Number two, pioneers in this space are going to move forward. Generation Z and Generation X and millennials demand transparency and they demand efficiency. The, the, the citizens demand it. And number three, elected officials like myself don't really care what you think. We care what our constituents think. So we're going to do this with or without you. So you have two options. Number one, you can be professional and you can stop spreading lies. And we'll work with you. And we'll move forward together. Or number two, you can continue to bully and spread lies. And we'll move on without you. And you don't get a seat at the table. It works. It works. So... 
Gerard then invited him, came in right after and said, well, those are your options. If you'd like a seat at the table, we're going to create a commission. Um, and ironically, everybody on the panel, those opposed and those against, agreed that it was better to work together than not work together. So Gerard put together a commission that I sit on um, and, uh, and these detractors do as well. And we have come together and we've started creating the standards that Josh was talking about. So the national institutes don't have standards yet. So we've come together with those who support mobile voting, the vendors who are currently providing mobile voting, and those philosophically opposed to mobile voting. And we started at the base level by defining terms. We, we came up with definitions of terms that we could all agree on. And then we've moved from there to come up with minimum standards. Um, as we move forward, we are creating, and the first set of standards was actually approved just last week. So we are creating standards. Thank you coming together and then we will be presenting these standards to the governing bodies as a place for them to start so that we can create certifications for this space because we are moving forward and uh, and honestly Gerard has been at the center of that he's the one who put the panel together he's the one who thought of the commission and he gets us started every week as we banter back and forth on what can and what can't and what is and what isn't so uh, thank you to Gerard but we are moving forward with the regulations and we're taking people that are diametrically opposed and those are four, and we're coming together and creating the standards so that we can have a future where voting is transparent and it's accessible and everybody can have confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let me ask you, do any of you want to go up against her? No. no.